So here I've gone to the EMBL at the EBI. So this is a repository of what on earth is this? A repository of data managed by the European Molecular Biology Laboratory and they have EBI sites in Heidelberg, in Hingston, which is in Cambridge, and also I think they have one in Spain. They might have another one. So I want to search through here. I want to search the databases. I want to search. So what kind of things can I search for? Yeah, I could search for genes. So what kind of things, what things could I type in here? If I type COVID-19 and I do a search, what happens? I get 43 results. Well, no, 43 results showing out of 569,833. Uh, there are 20 genomes and metagenomes. There are 274,712 nucleotide sequences. There are 3,308 dose sequences. Now, let's open this again. Open this again. I'm not going to type that. I'm going to type SARS of And that turns up 850,598. Whereas if I search for COVID-19, I got 569,833. So when I search for SARS-CoV-2, I've got 45 genomes, 676,702 nucleic acid sequences. Whereas before I only had 274,000. Now 53,131 protein sequences, then I had 3,308. I have 93 macromolecular structures. I've got 678 macromolecular structures. I've got two bioactive molecules. I've got 47. I've got 2,802 sets of gene expression. I've got 23. So just from something like that, you can instantly see that text is a bit of a problem. If you type the wrong text, the one that doesn't fit the name that we're currently using, then you don't get all the results that you might be expecting. This is a very big weakness of text-based searches. Oh, there's 72,836. But this one on COVID, you're getting more in the literature. So you get a smaller literature, but bigger than everything else. Weird. No enzymes in this one. Nine enzymes in this one. Protein expression data from 46. All interesting. Now, why is SARS-CoV-1, uh, SARS-CoV-2, sorry, called SARS-CoV-2? Because obviously there was a SARS-CoV-1 first. So the exciting and intelligent biologists name things saying the first time we see something, we'll call it one. Second time we see something related to it, we'll call it two. So you imagine you're finding transcription factors within an organism. No, let's say you're finding cyclin dependent kinases, CDKs. So the first one you find in an organism, you call CDK1. Next one you find in the organism, you call CDK2. The next one you find in an organism, you call CDK3, and so on. Then there's another research group who are not working in your pet organism. So let's say you're working on pandas. They're working on dogs. So they go and they get their, do their experiments and they isolate the cyclin-dependent kinases out of dogs. 
And the first one they find, they call CDK1. And the second one they find, they call CDK2. And the third one they find, they call CDK3, and so on. Now, the problem is, if you find molecules that do not correspond to each other between species in different uh, in those particular orders then it's nonsense so let's say cdk1 in my pandas is like cdk3 in my dogs but if i search the database for cdk1 i'll get it for the panda ones and the cdk1 from dogs will be something completely different uh, with different sequence and possibly even different structure. And the CDK3 from pandas will be completely different to the CDK3 from dogs. But if I'd have got the CDK1 and the CDK3, I could have found that they're actually very similar to each other. If I'd just searched, instead of by text and name, by the sequence itself. So this is the issue. With the databases most of the names are not going to be sensible or intelligent when scientists decide that something does something so even classification of, of enzymes there's some that are well classified so for example the glycolytic pathway mainly because we've been studying that for a long time since we were making fermentations so we know that we've isolated all of those particular proteins for a long time. But when we isolate a new protein and we don't know what it does, we have to experiment to find out what happens. So there was once a protein that they found and they decided in this lab, they were experts with types of enzymes called <coughs> Uh, well, halo peroxidases. peroxidases. Uh, these are actually, uh, you know, there's all this fuss about, uh, well, there was a lot of fuss about chlorofluorocarbons and halo carbons are not good things for the environment. Anyway, these particular uh, enzymes produce massive amounts of halo carbons. And seaweeds do it all the time mainly to create this kind of bleach and a kind of poison which kills everything off around them so that they're safe and anything that might be trying to eat them isn't. And they produce tons of the stuff, like a lot more than humans produce per year in chemical factories. So they've got this particular enzyme, uh, the new one they've discovered, and that is their particular speciality in this lab. So what they do is they get this new enzyme and they put it in a flask and they put all of the chemical reagents that they use for testing for producing halo carbons and it produces halo carbons and they go aha it is another halo peroxidase great fantastic now if they'd have taken the protein out of their solution and just had the chemicals they would have done the reaction anyway so the protein is actually doing nothing so they've just accidentally misclassified it because they didn't think what they were doing in doing their experiment and actually do a control. Because that's something that most scientists forget to do, even though they were taught it from primary school. So now they've put something in the database and it says at the top, this is a novel halo peroxidase with a completely different shape and sequence to any of the other known halo peroxidases. That's nice and groovy but it's actually an esterase. So it does esterification reactions. It has nothing to do with halo peroxidase. It just can do that function and it will mildly accelerate it uh, in the presence of the enzyme. So this is the problem. Characterizing things, any two lab can characterize exactly the same thing to say it does two different functions. And then you're gonna annotate it onto the sequence that you put in the database so the only thing you know and even then you probably don't trust it 100 percent when it's submitted to the database is the sequence all of the stuff they put at the top could be lies 
they could say, oh yeah, we overexpressed it in E. coli, but they didn't. They overexpressed it in something else. Just they can't be bothered to find what the something else was. They might actually not have overexpressed it at all, and they're just lying completely. The process of putting things into a database is the last thing you do before when you've written the paper or you finish your PhD. And the last thing you can care about is being careful in doing it. You dump it in, you move on, you do something else. So there is a lot of bad data out there, a staggering amount. This is why you have to be really careful about what you're doing. So here, simple text shows you that you, you have a text problem. So let's do something else instead.